It is truly heart-wrenching to report that since 1995, a staggering number of more than 400,000 Indian farmers have tragically taken their own lives, reflecting an epidemic of despair in the agricultural sector. Each of these individual cases represents a story of unbearable struggle, financial distress, and hopelessness. These farmers, who toil relentlessly to provide sustenance for the nation, find themselves increasingly burdened by mounting debts and inadequate government support. Maharashtra has the unfortunate distinction of recording the highest farmer suicide rate in India, with a staggering number of over 60,000 such cases. The regions of Vidarbha and Marathwada have been the hardest hit, grappling with the debilitating effects of drought, crop failure, and mounting debt, which have pushed farmers to the brink of extreme distress and hopelessness. Amhi vasar vasar. Amhi vasar vasar. Muki varhadi vasar. Kaya panhava to ami. Sora kalata tathar. Tapa tapa ghama unhara to kuhiwar. Moti pikava to ami. Tari upasi lekar. Kapusa pikava to ami ghama cha panyavar. Satra gati lugadale. Amachi pataki dotar. झाड़ जगव तो आम्ही काया भुई बर मुर्दा आमुचा अर्धाच जयते लाकुड नाही सर्ना वर नातेल बैला परी आमुचे दुसर्या हटी दोर देला हिसका जात्याले तरी रगत आमुच सांड नार From 2001 to 2011, it's one every half hour. One every half hour. Today, if you read your front page of the Times of India, there's a BJP MLA in Mumbai saying, oh, they're killing themselves, it's a fashion. <laughs> By the way, there have been 30 commissions of inquiry across the country on farmer suicides. In India, see, good old Indian tradition, our Sanskriti and everything else, the... Um, Good old Indian tradition of government is you will have as many inquiry commissions on the same subject as necessary until one of them gives you the report you want. <laughs> hmm. So we've had two vice chancellors, Veeresh in Karnataka conducted a survey and declared that leading cause of uh, suicide was alcoholism. And by the way, this was immediately supported by 90% of the media. We said, oh yeah, yeah, these guys drink like it. You know the problem with these arguments? If excessive drinking was the cause of driver of suicides, damn it, there'd be no journalists left in the world. <laughs> and, and very few academics. <laughs> and no human rights activists at all. Are you rolling sound? Rolling. rolling cameras? Rolling. Okay, clap. Shut, shut. Hey, shut up, ya Kunal. Shut up, ya Kunal. Chupna. Shut, 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 one of the most renowned journalists. Uh, I think, sir, you've been at the job for more than 40 years now. 42 years. Bro. 42 yeah. years and counting. Uh, there's a lot people know about you. There's a lot people don't know about you. But there's one thing you've spoken very little about that you got uh, awarded the 2009 Padma Bhushan, which you rejected. So you are the first uh, member of the award Wapsi gang before it became cool. I'd like to think so, but the truth is that, uh, say, had I been a sportsman or a musician or something, mm. I might have accepted it. And I have no objection to others accepting it. Mm -hmm. But a journalist, see, it, a journalist is an external auditor to government. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were invested in a company mm -hmm. and you found that your external auditor mm -hmm. was accepting awards and money and prize money from the company that he is reviewing mm. and you as an investor are depending on him to tell you the truth, mm. you're going to be very upset. 
right? Mm. Likewise, a journalist is an external auditor to government, mm. right? So you, I, I think that it is not correct for a journalist to do so. There are other journalists who have different opinions on it. I respect that, but I think that it hurts your credibility. Mm. You know, and it raises doubts about conflict of interest. So, uh, I did receive this call in 2009 and asking me and I, I said, see, I'm, not, I'm flattered, but I think it's wrong. Mm -hmm. Morally, journalistically, ethically, it is not, it does not fit in with the journalism I practice. So, and I did it. But the credits that added up to the award need to be acknowledged also, right? Like, what is it that they wanted you to be awarded for, the government of that time? See, at that time, I had been covering uh, deprivation and poverty for decades. And I had particularly been covering the agrarian crisis and farmers' suicides. In fact, in 2006, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh came down to Vidarbha because of reading the reports that I was writing in the Hindu. Mm. You know, he acknowledged that. I mean, he said that. So he said that he was disturbed by those reports. Then the National Commission for Farmers, headed by uh, um, Dr. M. S. Swaminathan, even before the Prime Minister came, they came and I took Dr. Swaminathan around to several farm households. And he was very upset and deeply moved. He was in tears in each household. So I think that the coverage of that, where I visited, in you know that in these last 20 years, I have visited more than 900 households where farmers have taken their own lives, destroyed my own health, my mm. mind, my everything. Mm. And a guy like me who before 2000 never had a cold or a cough or a headache. Mm. Yeah. But so the amount of work the Hindu was doing at that time, and I had that freedom in the Hindu then, mm. and Ram was editor. Is it he still editor? No, no, he's not, he's he's not long ago, long oh, ago. He's such a fabulous person. He was the editor in chief, and then after that he was publisher. Okay. So he's still a director of okay. the company, but he was the editor in chief. And it was phenomenal that rural India made front page. So I think that, you know, for the first time, we showed the scale of farmers' suicides. Yeah. At that time, nearly over 150,000 in, two, in uh, year 2007. Mm -hmm. And then it, it's now mounted to about 400,000. Mm -hmm. So that systematic coverage of mm -hmm. the countryside, I think, is what they felt that they wanted to recognize. However, in 2014, I quit the Hindu to start the People's Archive of Rural India, which the URL is ruralindiaonline.org. Kunal, the great media of this country, covers 6 to 8 percent of the country. Yeah. Pick up any newspaper, look at the date lines, where they're from. Do you know that in the, what we call the national dailies, that's mm. also a joke. Yeah. What we call a national daily is any newspaper mm. that has an edition in Delhi. Yeah. That's national. The rest of us are anti-national. Correct. Mm. And this national daily, average national daily, mm. five-year average, mm. gives 0.67% of its front page news to news of rural origin. 69% of the country's population get 0.67% of front page news. Inside pages, all the social sector, urban, rural, everything, everything, home, housing, development, environment, climate, agriculture, all the social sector beats put together have less space than crime and entertainment put together. And as you know, in India, crime and entertainment are seriously overlapping. Yeah. I mean, why do we cover Salman Khan's black buck case? Mm -hmm. Is it because we are in love with the black buck or because Salman Khan gets eyeballs? Mm. Because he's an entertainer. Correct. Right. So, 
in fact rural india is completely marginalized in the media mm. and this is the rule now another thing every one of us every one of us in this room for instance mm. every every one of your listeners mm. and readers mm. was a villager three generations ago yeah that's where we've come from yeah me one generation ago yeah. so uh, here we are ignoring where we came from if we do that we have no idea where we are going correct yeah. the r- rural india is magical for journalists it's brutal barbaric it's brilliant and beautiful both mm-hmm. it combines all these factors there are 780 living languages spoken in this country most of them in rural india eight of those languages are spoken by more than 50 million people four of them by more than 80 million one by nearly 500 million at the other end are the small adivasi languages which are dying out mm. spoken by less than 10000 people in the people's archive of rural india we consider it our duty to document record and thereby help preserve the diversity of indian culture at the same time we have to con- capture both the barbarity and the bestiality mm-hmm. the beauty and the brilliance mm-hmm. all these contradictions mm-hmm. are your society and as journalists we have to report not blindsidedly on one side we have to show the difference things i don't say two sides i never use that because i say sometimes there may be 20 sides to something yeah. in a country which has 5800 castes how can there be two sides or two three sides, sides or anything yes yeah. I, i just want to add yeah. that we turned this month yeah. on 20th yeah. people's archive of rural india completed 8 years in which time we have won every major journalism award in this country mm-hmm. a dozen abroad totally 54 awards that's what one every how many days yeah how many of your viewers and readers and the public know that up to august this year seven at least 720 journalists have died of covid 19 yeah many of them in the state of maharashtra yeah hmm? uh, that's why i have the fukuoka grand prize which i got mm-hmm. we are trying to help you know with 25000 per family as many families as we can yeah hmm. because many of them are your rural stringers you know the great newspaper houses of this country pays them 4000 rupees a month 5000 and their families are neck deep in debt because of the hospitalization charges anyway now if we can do this with virtually no resources because we are dependent on random donations hmm. if we can do this with virtually no resources imagine what the big media can do if they wanted to do something more than make a uh, maximize revenue yes ya ma we have fashion correspondents we have glamour correspondents we have society correspondents not a single newspaper or channel in this country has a correspondent working full time on poverty the lakme india fashion week was functioning in mumbai and you had 512 correspondents covering the event at the lakme fashion week that year the girls were displaying cotton gum in mumbai one hours flight away in vidarbha the men and women who grew that cotton were taking their own lives at the rate of 6 to 8 each day here the fastest growing media in the world a politically free media but imprisoned by profit there is the independent struggle there is the media of that time and then there is a certain sort of degeneration of media and then there is media after 2014 so that's a whole different conversation i feel so i just want to take your view on uh, what's happened with the media. what's happened with the media through your 40 four decades of journalism do you know that your media could not even tell you because today it it's mm. not important to them 
and they probably the average editor i mean uh, you know the minimum qualification for an editor was that you should have had a frontal lobotomy and mm-hmm. prove yourself utterly indepe- utterly incapable of anything even remotely approaching an independent thought <laughs> and if you manage that for 5 years you'd be editor in chief yeah hmm? so they could not tell you that in april this year you were observing the 200th anniversary of the great tradition of indian journalism which begins not with an europe with an englishman called john augustus hickey who was neither indian nor was his journalism about india it was about the East, about the european community mm. around the east india company 1822 april 12 raja ram mohan roy starts the mirathul akbar and what a tradition he sets he defends a riot a, i think the man was a peasant he defends the case of a i mean he brings up the case of a man called pratap narayan das who was ordered to be whipped by the district judge of komila now in bangladesh it was a some offense not a major thing he was ordered a whipping the police whipped him so hard he died mm. ram mohan roy wrote such a powerful passionate editorial about this that the then supreme court in the east india company in england summoned the district judge of komila to appear before it Hmm. compare that today when a siddiqui kappan kappan siddiq hmm. stayed in jail for over 2 years what did we do in the media huh? what did the great and powerful media houses do which could have raised the issue of siddiq and not only him of a of the other mohammad zubair in the andaman who took his own life yeah. and this mohammad zubair also spent so much time in yeah. thing Umar Khalid, two years yeah. plus. Yeah. Many, many cases. Stan Swami. An 83-year-old man suffering from Parkinson's disease has been asking for a sipper and a straw to be able to drink water in jail. Parkinson's disease is a debilitating disorder of the central nervous system. It can cause involuntary tremors or muscular spasms. As you can see, that's a a a, a a, a video of uh, Stan Swami. It can cause muscular spasms, which makes carrying out even everyday actions such as drinking liquids difficult but for a month now his plea for a simple straw and a sipper his painful plea that he can't drink liquids without his without it has made the rounds between jail authorities the NIA the courts stan swami was arrested by the NIA in ranchi on the 8th of october he is accused of being involved in a conspiracy to instigate caste violence in the bima korega vi- case this is in the bima korega village near pune in 2018 these are serious charges but still as of now they are only charges they are yet to be proved and so we are asking is this justice or cruelty and is it cruelty for the sake of cruelty so all this look at look at the tradition set in your journalists who were your journalists most of our kids don't understand that the most prolific journalists india ever had were gandhi and ambedkar 140 volumes of collected works between them mm. they don't understand even in punjab they don't understand mm. that the man we call the great martyr which mm. he was the revolutionary which he was mm. bhagat singh his occupation profession was journalist mm. and he wrote in four languages i want your young people to know this the man wrote in urdu in punjabi in english in hindi in multiple journals last 270 days in prison he learns persian and is writing in persian yeah all this by the time he is hanged at age 23 which is the age at which i began journalism yeah hmm? now this was the great tradition of indian journalism after independence the small newspapers magazines etc run by freedom fighters begin to crumble financially the support that government nehru gave genuinely believing it was necessary to support the media uh, to gain financial independence that was largely grabbed in terms of throw away rates of land in nariman point in bahadur shah zafar mar by big business houses 
So then by the mid 80s, in fact, there have been two press commissions in India, both of which you will find extensive discussions on the biggest threat to press freedom in India coming from ownership by business houses. But by the, yeah. I know, but look at yeah. where we are today. Yeah. Now it's corporate ownership, not even any, <coughs> any business yeah. house. And from the 90s, you have three convergences. Big political families going mm. into media, big mm. media families going into politics, big business, big corporate houses coming into media, big corporate skyens going into both politics and media. Correct. Yeah. You can you can find any number the the Badals in Punjab, the Marans in Tamil Nadu, mm. the Reddies in Andhra, you name it. The Dhakres in Samna. So yeah, why, why not? not? So everybody gets bigger and bigger in the media. And you have your media completely sewn up. Today, there are only two schools of journalists. This is what I teach my students every year. Mm. There are only two schools of journalism. There is journalism and there is stenography. Mm. Choose what you want to be. Yeah. Do you want to be a journalist? Or I, I have to tell you once that I was humiliated by an old gentleman in Tamil Nadu. I keep saying this everywhere. Yeah. That... You have to choose. Do you want to be a journalist or do you want to be a stenographer? Yeah. He got up and he berated me. And I said, sir, I'm very sorry if I've offended you. Yeah. Who are you? He said, I'm a stenographer. <laughs> I have been a stenographer for 30, 38 years. Yeah. Many years in the high court. Yeah. And we are much better than you fellows. <laughs> as, a, as court stenographers, we take everybody's version. Yeah. What the defense, the witness, the prosecution, the judge says. Yeah. You only take the views and versions of the powerful. Yeah. From that day, I amended it to corporate stenography. Yeah, corporate stenography. You know, there's, we are stenographers to power. Yeah. That is the thing. So, the, the media's degeneration is so total. Today, the media is an industry. Media entertainment industry is worth 1.81 trillion rupees. The, the figure for 2024, just mm. in time for the elections, mm. Ernest and Young, Ernst yeah. and Young tell us yeah. the media entertainment industry will be worth 1.2.31 trillion rupees. The media are not any more pro-business. They are big business. They are huge. Yeah, And the same guys who own the media then own, I mean, they, the farm laws are created for them. One reason the media could never ever tell you the truth about the farmer's struggle, which was the largest, the largest struggle for justice in the last 20 years, hmm? peaceful democratic protest. You know, many people point to Occupy Wall Street hmm. of 2011. Yeah. It lasted nine weeks. Hmm. The Kisan Andolan lasted one year and a month in Delhi alone. Yeah, before Don't, that, six, it, seven months. It was in Punjab, Punjab and elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. So you have that kind of a... And did your media ever tell you, Kunal, that Mr. Ambani's personal wealth, mm -hmm. going by Forbes, mm -hmm. is greater than the GDP of Punjab? Yeah. Or GSDP, as we say. Mm -hmm. Mr. Adani's personal wealth is greater than the GSDP of Haryana, which mm -hmm. is higher than that of Punjab. Now, the sheer unequal forces would stand naked if the media reported this, but they can't. Yeah. Because who owns them? Even jokes about like somebody will message me and be like, hey, you have 600 crores to buy uh, one end of the cricket stadium. So I'll be like, of course not. And that guy will be like, ha, fir baad mein mat rona, ammani ko bech diya. This whole thing of being fine <laughs> with like the... India being the most, one of the most unequal country where its wealth is concerned, but the third richest person in the world is Indian. They ignore the first part and the second part they think is something to be proud of. Actually, I think they should be looking at the uh, progression of how you came to that situation. Yeah, correct. One of the first things they need to know about the freedom struggle mm -hmm. was that what raised, what roused hundreds of millions of people to resist was the imposition of gross inequality. Yeah. And today, the World Inequality Report, the Forbes and others, the, the Credit Suisse Global Wealth Report shows us 
Yeah. I mean, all these reports show us that our inequality today mm. is matching the kind of inequality that we had in 1921 under the British and some say 1870s. Okay. So when they say this, they're not aware that in 1991, my source for these numbers yeah. are from Forbes. Yeah, of course. The Oracle of you know, Wealth Management. Yeah. Uh, Forbes, in 1991, we, we know that we did not have a single dollar billionaire in this country. Okay. In year 2000, we had eight. In year 2012, we had 53. On a couple of days before the lockdown, we had 98. That means between 1991 and 2020, we were adding 3, 4, 10, 12, 8 billionaires a year. Do you know how many we added in the first year of the pandemic? 42. So now we are at 150. Now, now you are at 160. Second year you added 26 more. Yeah, you are about 160, 162. It changes weekly with someone's share values. But the point is this. A hundred and sixty dollar billionaires yeah. own wealth equivalent yeah. to 24, 25 percent of your GDP. Correct. Okay, that is inequality. Yeah, yeah. and that's what your six hundred crore and questioner should understand. understand. And that was the kind that was the kind of inequality that led Indians to rise against, against injustice. The, yeah, British. And uh, you've written your second book, which is the Last Heroes. Uh, and this is like something that the foot soldiers of Indian freedom, like the name in itself uh, has a lot of questions that people would have. And well, to go back to the independence struggle uh, at a time like this. I think it's extremely relevant, mm -hmm. you know, and I think it's extremely relevant when a nation is asked, needs to ask itself, what is nationalism? What is patriotism? What did we fight? Look, Kunal, the government of India to celebrate 70, they say celebrating 75 years of Indian independence, they've started a website. Yeah. It's called Azadi Ka Amrut Mahotsav. Now, on this website, mm -hmm. yeah, there are, there is not a single photograph, not a single video, not a single article about or by, not a single statement or quote or illustration of a living freedom fighter though there are still some. Yeah. Now, if you're going to celebrate 75 years, celebrate them because in the next five years, not a single one will be left alive from what I have always called India's golden generation. Those who brought us independence. Not mm. a paragraph telling us what did we fight for and what did we fight against. There is no description. Mm. There's nothing to tell a new generation what was British colonialism? A hundred million plus excess deaths in the mortality rates. Mm -hmm. 20, 31 famines, killing tens of millions of human beings. Wars taking millions of human lives. Extermination of entire tribes or tribal clans and communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And the, most kids don't realize that the struggle against the British began within, three, did not begin with 1857, mm -hmm. but began within three years of the Battle of Plassey, mm -hmm. when the Adivasis of Jungle Mahal, now in West Bengal, then Purulia, mm -hmm. were already revolting against the changes in land revenue. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't say anything about the cruelty and barbarity of British colonialism mm -hmm. and shameful, in the 75th year of your independence, you lower your flag to mourn the symbol of that colonialism, the death of Queen Elizabeth. A day of state mourning will be observed in India today as a mark of respect for the death of Queen Elizabeth. She died on Friday at the age of 96. A statement issued by the Ministry of Home Affairs said that on the day of mourning, the national flag will be flown at half mast through India on all buildings and there will be no official entertainment on the day. How does that feel to your living freedom fighters who know what they fought against? And if this is the case, of, as I said, there's not a single photograph of any of the living people. There are plenty of photographs. You know whose photographs? Yeah, of course. Right from the government websites to the gas cylinders. Yeah. It's the same photograph. Yeah. There are videos. 
There are articles on drone tech, India's advances in drone technology and the Prime Minister's speech at the G20. I cannot for the life of me figure out what the heck this has to do with 75 years of independence. Correct. Same. But that brings us to an important question that I've asked many people, but I'd love to ask you, especially in light of this book. What is the difference between independence and freedom? Every one of the freedom fighters in this book makes this distinction between independence and freedom. Independence was throwing out the colonial ruler. Mm-hmm. Yeah? India becomes an independent state. Every one of them sees freedom as a much larger project than independence. Mm-hmm. And let me, let me point out to you, when we are talking about Azadi Ka Amrut Mahotsav, The very same government that put up this website five years ago was arresting students and throwing them into jail for shouting the slogan Azadi. A teenager, 17-year-old boy today entered the Jamia area. He took out a gun, a country-made pistol. He brandished this pistol. He shouted slogans like uh, Delhi Police Zindabad, Yelo Azadi. He then proceeded to fire. A student was injured in his hand. Luckily, there was no serious injury. But what's most worrying in this whole thing is the Delhi police who were there in full strength. They stood and watched as this teenager took out a gun. They only reacted after he fired. Mm. Now they've appropriated the term and made it the the name of their website. Correct. So Azadi meant something after independence also. Swatantrata and Azadi. All these freedom fighters tell you. That was the fight against British colonial rule. Mm. That was to eject the colonial ruler. Freedom, you will find, as all of them also tell you, that you will find what the meaning of freedom is in the constitution of India. Mm. Which is, and to my mind, remains the finest distillation, the essence of the ideals of the freedom struggle. Which is why, by the way, I get very offended when people make lists of freedom fighters and do not include Baba Saheb Ambedkar, Mm -hmm. who, as a freedom fighter, he launched the greatest battle on the face of the earth for human dignity, a battle that still continues. That's freedom, Mm -hmm. right? And the justice for all, social, political, economic, Mm -hmm. that's freedom. Your directive principles of state policy, all children shall, you know, education, nutrition, health, the direct, not the fundamental rights, I'm talking about the directive principles of state mm-hmm. policy. Only two constitutions in the world have such a chapter to my knowledge. The Irish constitution, which inspired us, the 1921 Irish constitution, in the following the Irish uprising against the British. But uh, a lot of people who are young and uh, haven't seen constitution or haven't seen a lot of uh, identity deciding your merit kind of situations in life, they seem to believe that our constitution is very influenced by the West's idea of liberty and freedom uh, and not maintaining India's uh, cultural differences in mind. So would you like to... (coughs) Yeah, well, two things. One is that, you know, everything we ascribe to the West, it's shameful that we don't know that there were great debates on the rights of human beings in India for over 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. The way history was written, we are accepting, in fact, British historians and historiography. You know, Indians didn't know anything about freedom. They didn't know anything about rights. A few Indians went to Oxford and Cambridge and Eton and Harrow. There they read Jean-Jacques Rousseau, mm-hmm. the social contract. They read Hobbes and Locke and learnt about enlightenment from the West. Mm-hmm. This is a very racist population. Yeah. There is a great... The, the notion of freedom, the notion of rights, will necessarily differ from society to society. But there are certain universalities. And you can look at them in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of the United Nations of 1945, itself, which at least one Indian bureaucrat had a hand in shaping, mm. along with Eleanor Roosevelt, mm. who was thought to be the inspiration behind that Universal Declaration of Human Rights. 
And incidentally, that universal declaration of human rights, everybody talks about Article 19, freedom of expression, because it was a Cold War tactic. Mm. Nobody talks about the invisible clauses of the human rights declaration. Articles 23 to 28, mm. the right of work, workers to organize the strike, the right of workers to demand a decent family wage, mm. yeah? the right to culture, all these. And India had a role in shaping that. Mm. Right? So one is that it's a lack of knowledge and an acceptance of colonial historiography mm. that makes us think so that we didn't have any of this until the West came. Second, about the constitution, it was influenced by so many things. Like the Irish inspiration for the directive principles of state policy. They were also a colonized people. All this is true, but it also is true that it drew its essential inspiration from the struggles of the Indian people. That's why it brought in the, about the right of every child to education, you know, in, in the directive principles, about the right to food, nutrition, which courts have been discovering are valid. In fact, the Supreme Court in the last 40 years has given three judgments saying mm. the directive principles of state policy, even if they are not justiciable in a court of law, are every inch as important as the fundamental rights. And I also want to point out to you that some of these youngsters do realize that. There may be those under the you know sway of you know fundamentalist ideology who think mm. so, but the, um, what do they want us to be inspired by? Mm. Legal, you see, the, in 1940s, in, in the late 1940s and in 1950 when the constitution came out, the RSS mouthpiece condemned the constitution saying there is nothing Bharatiya in this. Mm. Hmm? There is nothing Bharatiya in this. It's all borrowed. And that this is, in fact, they are on the same level as British historiography. Mm, yeah. Mm. And it's all borrowed. And we should have been actually basing ourselves on our own historic legal um, masterpieces of legal jurisprudence, of jurisprudence, by which they meant the Manusmriti. Yeah. So, uh, as reactionary and nasty a document mm. as ever devised by human hand. So you, you have but... Counter to that, in 2019, what do you see? You see thousands of youngsters across the country protesting against the CAA, the NREC issue is burning. And what are they reading from? They're reading from the Constitution, the Constitution of India. So there is a continuity in that trend of looking at freedom and the Constitution. Not that the constitution is perfect or there's nothing in it that should not be changed, but these are core principles of the constitution. When you go through uh, the minds of like young people, they uh, often use freedom and independence. Interchangeably. Yeah. That so, is again a, a way of look, a way of how history has been written. Mm -hmm. Kunal, my favorite saying about history comes from Africa, mm -hmm. not the West. In Swahili, there's a saying which goes, if lions were historians, the tales of the jungle would not favor the hunter. Right? In other words, history is always written by the victors. Yeah. In our case, we were so stupid. 30 years after the British left us, we were still using British history. It's only in the late 60s, early 70s, that India produces the finest historians who are challenging the stuff, the myths. Mm. Romila Thapar, Bipin Chandra, um, K. N. Panikkar, S. Gopal, mm -hmm. S. Bhattacharya, Harbans Mukhya in medieval history. Mm. They are challenging the historiography of the winner mm. and replacing it. Right? Mm. And as I said, Gandhi said in, in his... In 1931, he writes a letter from Yerwada Jail. He says, great men appear to be the cause of revolutions in the world. Mm. In truth, 
the people themselves are the cause. Yeah. In fact, that's the first line of the introduction in this book. Yeah. The people themselves are the cause. Mm. So here are a bunch of people, not just one of whom ever completed college. Mm -hmm. Many of them never went to school or were thrown out of class by class three or class four, mm -hmm. telling you what freedom means. Correct. So basically, this uh, <coughs> book kind of gives you uh, the sort of representation and a fair idea of what representation the freedom struggle had. Uh, why were these stories, they are not hidden, but why does one not feel like finding these stories proactively? Actually, I want to tell the youngsters who follow your program, <laughs> yeah. I want to tell them one thing. Some of you, some of them, are young enough not only to have grandparents, but even great-grandparents, right. those who are 17, 18. Yeah. Hmm? I'll tell you this. Go back to your own grandparents, great-grandparents. Hmm. You will find that every family has a story from the freedom struggle. Yeah. Somebody is Nana, Nani, somebody who went to jail, somebody who went underground, yeah. somebody who sat in Satyagraha and protest. You will find that every family, there are some families which will have very nasty stories, but there are very few. Those yeah. are very few, usually yeah. from the Raja Rani Lok yeah. and from the fundamentalist streams. Yeah, correct. But the rest of the Indian people have nothing to be ashamed of. They have yeah. everything to be proud of in the struggle for freedom, which the representation comes in this way. We narrowed it down to a bunch of people educated at Oxford and Cambridge. Hmm. Whereas in the book you will find farmers, laborers, cooks, couriers, homemakers, even cooks, okay, yeah. and their role in the freedom struggle. Yeah. If most of them are not asking for money or pension. They're asking, one of them says, we fought for freedom, not for pensions. The others, I desperately feel that they should get the pension Mm. because they're in such bad shape. Mm. But the way we went and defined independent freedom fighter in a particular way that denied tens of millions of Indians any recognition, which is what they want. It's heartbreaking to me that your audience, the young audience, they and the next generations will never get to sit down with, engage with, talk to, listen to, touch a genuine freedom fighter because in five years, not one of them will be left. The youngest person alive in this book is 97 now. And he'll be 90. Oh yeah, he turned 98 yesterday. I'm sorry. Yeah. And the oldest is 105. Five. Babani Mahato. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, you felt like honoring and recognizing these people because there's a colonial hangover in how we look at freedom fighters. I've yes. heard you speak about this also. Absolutely. You see, the, the Swatantrata Sainik Samman Yojana, there were two laws. One was introduced in 1972, mm -hmm. then it was replaced in 1980. They brought the Swatantrata Sainik Samman Yojana. A bunch of bureaucrats made a bunch of criterion mm -hmm. which exclude all ordinary people. Yeah. Okay. One, you ought to have gone to jails. Now, yeah. lots of women participated in the millions and millions, did serious work behind the scenes, mm -hmm. underground and from home, which did not lead them to jail, but they participated in the freedom struggle. Mm -hmm. Lakshmi Panda, in this book, she asks mm -hmm. me in Koraput, because I did not put a bullet in another human being's body, am I not a freedom fighter? She was working as a cook at the kitchen girl in Netaji Bose's forest camps. During the famine. Do, uh, no, no, this is, yeah, I mean, but this was when they were being bombed by the British. Her parents were killed in British bombing, which is why she went and joined the INA at age 13. And she says, because I never fought, because I never killed anyone, because I never went to jail, are you saying I did not make a contribution to the freedom struggle? Correct. Second, they say property confiscation. If you don't have this jail, okay, you must have had... Pro how many Indians own property today? Yeah. Third, they said you have to get the certificate mm. for the jailing. 
today the lack of the lack of under trials one lakh mm. or more under trials in the country poor people can't afford to get a lawyer to get them out of right. under trial status where will they where will they go and get you proof of 40 years ago that they were in jail it go and then the worst part of it is it says you should if you participated in the underground resistance voluntarily hmm. you are not eligible you ought to have been proclaimed an offender mm-hmm. by the british so we are asking the colonial power yeah. to certify to give certification for our freedom fighters yeah. and that that swept aside a lot of revolutionaries now in 70s 72 the communist party both communist parties at that mm. time declared that we will not accept pension because we didn't fight for pension mm. looking back i i really wish they had because so many of those fighters in telangana etc i wish at least in the 90s the left parties had changed that position because they're in such terrible shape physically medically mm-hmm. i just wish something happened but overall i wish that we found a different way of recognizing our freedom fighters like babani mahato Mm. she kept telling me i'm not a freedom fighter she's in this mm. book she's the oldest person alive in this book she and telu mahato mm. she said i was not a freedom fighter my husband was a freedom fighter mm. by dinath mahato mm. i said why she said he was in jail 13 months so i said it must have been very hard for you when your husband was away 13 months in jail she said no it was much worse when he came back because he kept bringing more and more friends for me to feed <laughs> finally i understood <coughs> that at the height of the bengal famine mm. babani mahato was growing food mm. cooking food and feeding 20 25 underground revolutionaries hiding in the forests of purulia now if that is not participation in the freedom struggle i have no idea what is correct mm. so i'm saying we need to recognize them we yeah. need to recognize their contribution yeah. so i really wish that people will explore their own families their own histories they will find what a huge spectrum of the indian population stood up and fought and brought down the mightiest empire in the world yeah in in fact you know but i went to school at a time when you still had these textbooks tell us when you still had these textbooks tell us the sun never set on the british empire yeah no. i grew up in a family of freedom fighters yeah. hmm? and our it, we had my granddad studied in ireland and was nearly faced to firing squad there was expelled yeah. deported i prefer the irish version of the saying yeah. the sun never set on the british empire yeah. the irish said the sun never sets on the british empire because even god can't trust those bastards in the dark <laughs> true yeah. so that that was that was that is the saying i yeah. go with yeah hmm? but there's a lot of you know i'm just kind of telling you the common a political uh, you know views views which is like what i hear and i get disappointed because maybe i can't articulate it better but there is one view which says that india has been at war or at uh, at rebelling about something for ha uh, for many years and will continue and there is no this is a never ending process and things will never be settled okay. so what do you think about views okay. like these two things one is that let me tell you my own view of youth having been a teacher for 37 years yeah. i teach journalism i teach globalization etc is that the you default mode of youth is idealism yeah yeah after we teach them after they go through they go into institutions they go into newspapers where their seniors mock them oh this fellow's come to change the world another yeah. Yeah. you know and they beat the idealism out of them yeah hmm. i keep telling my students that even those worst cynics in the newspapers who are mm. telling you this ask them why and how they entered journalism mm. 
they too were different ones. I believe the default mode of youth is I idealism. It's our generation that has failed them. My generation that has failed them. We have failed them. And we are stuffing their heads with utter nonsense. Yeah. Like this 800 years. Uh, by the way, it's happening on the Azadi Ka Amrut Mahotsa. Yeah. Now you're saying celebrating 75 years of independence. Mm. But there you are bringing uh, Lachit Borpo Khan. You're bringing... You're, they're moving backwards long before the freedom struggle from 17th mm -hmm. century. Mm -hmm. They will stop at Alauddin Khilji. Yeah. That's where they're headed. Yeah. But that is not being done by your young. Mm -hmm. That is being done by extremely cynical ideologues mm -hmm. who know exactly what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Azadi Kamrut Mahatsav has a feature. Did you know, you know, yeah. interesting <laughs> facts. One of the questions and answers is, did you know yeah. that every Siva temple in Tamil Nadu has a separate special shrine for Kashi Vishwanath. Mm. So what, what does that have to do with 75 years of freedom? But it does have something to do with what they are preparing for in Kashi Vishwanath. Correct. Hmm? So yes, you're right. That concept of the freedom struggle is being pushed to 600 years before colonial yeah. British rule. 800 years, it's going back. But it's a very conscious thing by very cynical ideologues. Mm. And I don't think we should blame the victim. Yeah. These are victims of propaganda. False consciousness, False propaganda. Consciousness. And a, there is a certain appeal to a trend in the middle class to consider ourselves somehow the most special people in the world. Yeah. This has happened in many others. In Germany, they also, you know, they were the... Um, they were the uh, Aryan superior races. That's what they considered yeah. themselves. And uh, while speaking about 75 years of independence, the British in this country, mm. the one group of people who fought them relentlessly, as you'll see in the story on Salihan, mm -hmm. the Adivasis in this country were the one group that never compromised with the British. For a hundred years, they were fighting them when the remaining elites were mm -hmm. negotiating an accommodation in the colonial hierarchy, mm -hmm. the Raja Rani Lok. Mm -hmm. So much, so great was the resistance mm -hmm. that in 1871, the British passed a law, the Criminal Tribes Act, mm -hmm. criminalizing 200 tribes, mm -hmm. saying that you are genetically criminals, mm -hmm. the Pardis, mm -hmm. the Pahadiyas, mm -hmm. all of them. Right, and you know that, you know Kunal, that is 60 years before Nazi no. Germany yeah. said a similar thing. Yeah. But we think the British were sportsmen yeah. and fair play they believed yeah. in. Yeah. And the Nazis were bad. Yeah. The British anticipated the Nazi yeah. ideology by a hundred years. Correct. Tried it on Indians. Yeah. Basically, the, even struggles of Birsa Munda, like not spoken about in, in our history, was a very big tribal leader. And, and there are there are many others. Yeah. You know, there's a university now in the country in Purulia called Birsa Munda Siddhu and Birsa Siddhu and Kano. Mm -hmm. Siddhu and Kano uh, Murmu mm -hmm. brothers, they led the Great Santal Rebellion. It was a huge thing. Yeah. One year. I mean, before 1857. Mm. And that the kind of courage they showed and the kind the British officers have written, mm. how they, their men wept in the evenings, mm. how these people with axes, bows mm. and beating drums were yeah. mowed down by cannon and rifle, but still kept coming and fighting. Mm. Now we have erased them from our history. Yeah. yeah? And creating fake heroes. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm saying the young have been, there are different trends in the young also. Those yeah. who have, who are reading from mm -hmm. justice, social, economic, political, from the mm -hmm. constitution. Yeah. And those, because they have no optional source with the media, yeah. completely in support of fundamentalism, they have mm -hmm. no other source of knowledge on history. The good history books are being withdrawn, pulped. The historians are being vilified and pilloried. 
so thank you so much it was amazing to talk to you and to all the uh, viewers of the episode i'd like to say that this is a living example of jo college mein socho wo 4 saal ke baad mat chhodo idea uske sath thoda aur saal reh sakte ye 4 decade rahe hain thank you so much sir for coming and thank you for signing your book i will put a call out for people to buy this in the description thank you thank you shut shut hey shut up ya kunal shut up ya kunal kitna so like just to come back to your book there's a very important chapter which is uh, you know a subject which is till today a polarized subject which is gandhi versus ambedkar where uh, there's a chapter in your book which says must i pick between gandhi and ambedkar so could you please elaborate your views on i think the the first thing is to look at <coughs> the respect and dignity with which both gandhi and ambedkar conducted their own interaction and correspondence yeah you do not find abuse yeah you have you have strong differences you have very strong disagreement but they both knew and respected each other that's one thing um the present day debates have become either you're with gandhi or you're with ambedkar you cannot possibly find both to be you know having had an important role in our history and that was a question therefore that i put to this character called shobha ram geherwar he is a dalit and a and a dalit who lives in the very basti the very place he was born 97 years ago he's been twice a low level local corporator but accumulated no wealth mm. self declared gandhian mm. but also something very important about these about the whole lot of them like geherwar i asked geherwar when i went to his home the self declared gandhian said it's april 14th ambedkar jayanti hmm aapke paas gaadi hai kya jeep hai kya so yes, of course i come all the way to see him from jaipur in a vehicle so he said um, the central market ajmer mein jayenge wahan baba saab ko murti hai unko mala lagana hai i said sure as he put he put the garland and he stepped down i asked him how does someone like you a self declared gandhian choose between a gandhian and ambedkar and he got angry so aap choose karo why should i choose what principles of the mahatma i respected and revered those principles i followed what principles of baba saheb i respect and revere those principles i follow aur main aapko ye bhi kehna chahta hu maine dono nadiyan mein gaya gandhivad aur krantivad he made bombs as a young teenager yeah. yeah and he was part of the revolutionary underground hmm. and it raised really raised an incredible number of things in my head yeah here was a man with gandhi admiring ambedkar in fact he carried some correspondence to ambedkar as a courier once as a boy still in his teens or maybe not even entered his teens and he was you know making bombs then i realized that it's wrong to pigeon hole these people that they were open as today very few people are to a large range of influences mm. yeah he did not say that uh, that's coming from ambedkar i won't touch it or this is coming from gandhi i won't touch it and he learned something from the revolutionaries as well so i'm saying that that is a lesson for all of us in the present in our contemporary times to learn mm. that these are not mutually exclusive Philosoph- categories yeah. or philosophies there are very strong differences on which you can i believe 
in the argument on caste for instance i believe ambedkar won that argument yeah okay i believe so does it make gandhi a scoundrel and someone to be discarded as not that's nonsense it's yeah. stupidity and if you look in the book there is another story between bapu and the bandits mm-hmm. there are telu and loki mahato one is 97 the other is 104 Telu is 104 and Loki is 97. Mm. They were involved in the Purulia march on the police stations in 1942. Mm. And uh, their hero in the in big Bengalis in that area the large hero on their horizon was Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose. Their national level hero was Gandhi whom they never met. Mm-hmm. or even saw but there was a certain moral authority and a moral code that they mm-hmm. followed from him their local heroes were three decoits yeah mm. they were three decoits of a tribe that had fought the uh, british like anything correct and i was trying to see how they reconcile these different positions <laughs> the three decoits you'll find a very beautiful book discussing this the role of that bandit in history by eric hobsbaw the famous historian it's called bandits mm. and it's looking at social banditry mm. the entire robin hood philosophy mm. now these three bandits whom they admired fitted that they would stand up for that small fellow against the big landlord they would go and threaten the landlord not to oppress these people too much so they are caste heroes in general they were their heroes though they were from different castes these were kurmis those were at another tribe but they were fighting the dominant <clears throat> caste they were fighting the dominant power of that area and they were anti british yeah so what i understand and what i learned from it is that they were open to a very wide range of influences correct all of them in fact i find and i came to conclude that the only way i can describe all these people many of those people in this book they were leftist by political persuasion and gandhian by moral code and principle and you know that fits to many of india's greatest leftists mm. ems namudri path the most original thinker of the indian communist movement mm. for decades had that photograph of gandhi in his office Mm. CPM leader I mean he had mm. a Gandhi picture in his office and wrote a lovely book the mahatma and the ism mm. where he calls gandhi the tallest son of the now here's another one one of the most moving one of the most moving moments of my life in 19 in 2017 we felicitated you know three of the people in this book are from maharashtra and they belonged to a group called the tufan sena the tufan sena was the armed wing of a of the underground government of satara called prati sarkar in 1943 the british were on the defensive in europe mm. there was a threat of german invasion so all soldiers went to britain all over the world british colonies rose in revolt recognizing the weakness of the british government mm. satara in maharashtra in those days it was a huge you know a princely territory i mean it was a huge place it included sangli it included all those areas and satara declared independence from british rule for 3 years this government of farmers and laborers mm. held they held sway in 600 villages and the first line of the book is from the leader of the tufan sena the underground army we fought for two things freedom and independence mm. we achieved independence captain mm. bab yeah. yeah so that was the that was their attitude now in 2017 together with the all india kisan sabha because the head of the prati sarkar was one of the presidents of the kisan sabha in the 1950s we organized a felicitation for the survivors of the tufan sena 
I expected eight, ten people would show up. They're all in their late eighties. One or two were hundred. Mm-hmm. These were all revolutionaries who had split with Gandhi, disillusioned by the Quit India movement being stopped. When they felt we should go ahead and throw the British out, they differed with Gandhi so strongly. They broke away, formed the Prati Sarkar, etc. These were people who had rebelled against Gandhi. You know who I took as the chief guest to felicitate them? Gopal Gandhi. Twenty-three of them showed up because they wanted to see and touch Gandhi's grandson, which told me that they differed with Gandhi. They disagreed with him. They fought with him. They never hated him. Correct. They always revered and admired him, but said. We don't agree with you on this. We think that this is the time to throw the British out. And in 1946, when Gandhi gave a call for independence is coming now, everybody come back to the mainstream. They dissolved the Prati Sarkar and the Tufan Sena. Captain Bhav could not control his tears when he hugged Gopal Gandhi. Okay, it shows me how a generation. Rose about their politics, about their persuasion, about their caste, about their class, about so many of the prejudices which we are entrenching today in society. Mm-hmm. How these ordinary people rose about them, and it seemed like it seemed like they needed to be there to reconnect with Gandhi. It was such a powerful moment. I could not, I could feel my own tears. Mm-hmm. When Captain Bow was holding on, he was already Captain Bow was already ninety-five at that age, and holding on. And that same philosophy of theirs, we fought. They fought for farmers and laborers. At the time of the Kisan Andolan, at the time two thousand eighteen, the Great Kisan March on Parliament, mm. Captain Bow and Hausa Bai Patil, both old Tufan mm-hmm. Sainiks. Mm. Captain Bow came out on the streets of Sangli at 95. Mm-hmm. I see the photograph on Facebook, and I ask him, I, I ask him, Captain Bow, what are you doing out in the sun at this time? Mm-hmm. You're 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 96 years old. Mm-hmm. He says, then also, it was for farmers and laborers. Mm-hmm. Now also, I am for farmers and laborers. Okay, that's mm-hmm. also a bit of the continuity of your. Resistance, the idea of resistance in India. Mm-hmm. Hausa Bai sent a video message to the farmers, and the, both of them sent video mm-hmm. messages to the farmers in Jantar Mantar. If it were not for my ill health, she mm-hmm. said, I would be marching there besides you. And believe me, if this government provokes us any more, I will come. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, this was a group of people who rose above their class status. These were landed farmers. They have fought for laborers. When they looted the train in the greatest train robbery of its time, yeah. when they looted the train, they distributed the money among starving peasants and laborers. Mm. At the time when the Bengal famine was causing a rise in prices, food prices everywhere, the loot from the train could purchase sixty sixty-five thousand kilograms of rice, but they distributed it to help ordinary people. So that is the thing I'm saying. Here were people who were revolutionaries. Mm. Also, in the book is a man called Baji Muhammad, mm. a Muslim. Mm. Again, look at the peculiar influences. Mm. He was the president of the Koraput and Odisha uh, Anti Cow Slaughter Society. Yeah. The man who is the president of the Anti Cow Slaughter Society is a man whom I knew who kept. Quran, Bible, and Bhagavad Gita on his table. Mm-hmm. And in 1992, he is describing in the book how he was had his skull opened. First, you think he is talking about British rule, but actually it was done at the Babri Masjid yeah. when there were 200 Gandhians sitting on darna. But he was recognizably a Muslim, so they came and fractured his skull, and he spent. A month going back to hospital, back and forth. Yeah. So, yet no bitterness, yeah. just love. Correct. Okay, no bitterness, and I think you need to learn. All of us need to learn something 
about the ideology of hatred and its futility and how much damage it causes to this country yeah. and the ideology of we need to unite, we need to rise above our prejudices, we need to shed our caste's prejudices, we need to shed our class prejudices. And that's what I'm saying is the beauty of the preamble and the um, directive principles of state policy. Justice for all, social, economic and political. And Kunal, I don't believe that putting the word social first was an accident. Of course. We are not calling the constant the country India and Bharat is also yeah. not an accident. It's by yeah. design so that it doesn't become Hindustan. Yeah. Because it's supposed to be a secular That's right. state.